Hi, my name is Zach Lockram, and I'm an managing principal at Asakura Robinson. Um, I am very excited to be here today to share with you the concept plan for the Uptown Corridors Revitalization Strategy for Staples and Leopard with the City of Corpus Christi. Um, let me allow my colleague Wei to introduce himself as well. Hey, my name is Wei Shao. Um, I am Senior Urban Designer with Asakura Robinson, also the Project Manager for this project. Very excited to be here today. Um, as we both said, we are working with Ascura Robinson. We're an urban planning, urban design, and landscape architecture firm um, based in, in Texas. And we're very excited to be working with a great team at the city of Corpus Christi, um, including Dan McGinn, the director of planning, and Karen Costanzo, the economic development manager. We began this project in May of 2021, um, working through a first phase that we call understand. Um, during that phase, we did a significant amount of work looking at both data um, impacting the um, corridors. So really trying to understand the on the ground, what, what was happening in those areas, but really also working to match that up with um, the expertise of people in the community. So we did a significant amount of public engagement including a survey um, that was open for several months, a public meeting, um, working with a technical assistance group and working with a group of business owners in the corridor. The second phase that we've been in, um, really starting off in the fall, um, is the phase that we call Envision. And during this phase, what we're really working to do is take the information that's been gathered, um, really work with that to develop a vision for what we want to see happen in the corridor and really start to put some specifics to what needs to be done in order to achieve that. Um, during that time, we've had a second work, uh, a set of work with the business group, um, as well as an additional technical group meeting. Um, and this video is meant to coincide with the release of a public survey. Um, so this video is going to give you some information that you'll need um, on what is planned in order for us to be able to move that forward. As I said, we've done a significant amount of public engagement as a part of this process. And I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about some of the things that we've heard about the corridor. Um, on the screen now, you can see that there's a, a number of key themes that really came up um, through all of the different ways that we began to approach public engagement. Um, there are some issues in the corridor, including homelessness and perceptions of crime. Um, there's a strong desire for the area to be more walkable and for the economic opportunities to grow within the area. And then there's a lot of specifics, you know, better lighting, better shading, better signage, better branding, a strong mix of local businesses and attractions, um, funding for street festivals. So really focusing on some of the things that we really want to see happen in order to help drive forward uh, more opportunity within the Staples and Leopard corridors. So today we're going to be presenting to you the concept plan. Um, we're going to talk first a little bit about what we call character zones. So these are the, you know, we, we have long corridors here that actually go through a number of different types of places. And so the goal is to really begin to break that down into smaller, more manageable opportunities um, and think about what each one of those areas needs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our goals and vision um, that have been developed for the community. And then we're going to talk about the toolkit of recommendations that includes both um, design or projects, um, includes policy changes, and then includes programs, um, opportunities to um, really bring more um, activity and more opportunity, economic opportunity to the area as well. So we've divided the corridors that we're talking about into four character zones. Um, zone one, we call the Civic Square. Um, this is the area around City Hall. Zone two, East Leopard, um, the area that serves as sort of a gateway between the downtown and uptown areas. Zone three, we talk about the Mid Staples Cultural Heritage District. And then zone four, we talk about really building on all of the success that's already happening at six points and, and really talking about the ways that we can extend that activity to a greater area. I'm gonna go into each one of these in a little more detail. 
So zone one, um, the civic square, you know, this is an area that's largely comprised of offices and civic buildings. Um, there's also a concentration of homeless shelters and other services for homeless, the homeless community in this area. Um, there's a lot of visitors during the day because of the courthouse, the city hall, and the bus station, which is the busiest in the city. Um, and there's a, a little less activity um, or a little less positive activity, I'll say, um, at, in other parts of the days. So as we thought about this area, we really thought that we wanted to double down on the idea that this is really a, an area that should be devoted to citizen services and really working to build this as a civic campus. So looking um, to develop offices that relate to those civic uses, so things like legal, as well as services for employees, you know, lunch, restaurants, dry cleaning, and so on. So when we talk about this area, and we'll flip to the next slide here, we think about redevelopment opportunities to add additional civic uses, such as libraries or museums, um, looking at offices, and looking really at opportunities for active ground floor uses. Um, we also have opportunities within what we call the public realm. So, you know, the spaces that are owned by the city, the, the, whether that's, you know, parking lots or private property or whether that's the roadways. Um, and we really think that there's a key opportunity that we'll talk about more here for a new civic open space that will really um, be centered on City Hall. The second area um, we call East Leopard. And as I said, this is kind of the gateway between downtown and uptown. Um, the area already has a lot of high rise buildings with mixed use development. There's a lot of multi-level parking um, in the area and it really is that gateway. So when we think about this, we are gonna see it continue to really be a lot of high rise buildings. So there's going to be a lot of employment and that we need to think about it as a key gateway to the downtown area. In terms of redevelopment opportunities, we expect that we'll continue to see mixed use development and um, that we'll continue to see development that really serves the office employees within those areas. When we talk about public realm opportunities, um, there's an opportunity for there really to be some public art that really helps serve as that gateway. And then looking at opportunities for plazas or public or pocket parks uh, as they associate with the office buildings in the area around. The third area is what we call the Mid Staples Cultural Heritage District. Um, this area connects with Agnes and Laredo streets, which serve as a key connection to Crosstown Expressway and to the city's west side and to downtown. There's a significant concentration of abandoned buildings and vacant land in this area. Um, and there is also significant opportunity, uh, significant amount of property that's actually only under one owner in this area. Um, this is an area that has a um, strong concentration of heritage businesses that cater to the Latino community, um, as well as a number of heritage businesses that um, cater to the LGBTQIA community in this zone. One of the key things that we want to see here is a continued reuse of the existing buildings. So really see some of the vacant and abandoned buildings be turned into new uses, um, bringing new opportunities in there, and then really taking advantage of the fact that so much of this land is under one ownership to really look at larger scale redevelopment opportunities to bring new activity into the space. In terms of the public realm opportunities, we think this is an area that we can really center both the Latino community and the LGBTQ community in really thinking about art and placemaking, um, as well as really looking at key opportunities for park improvements and opportunities to reuse some of the vacant land as new open spaces. The final district is what we call the extended Six Points District. So Six Points is already one of the most unique and authentic destinations in the city of Corpus Christi. And what we really wanna do is help build on that success. So we wanna really think about the ways that we can um, continue to bring the energy of new businesses and new opportunities and really have this be a destination that rivals even Congress Avenue in Austin um, for small, unique, authentic Corpus Christi businesses. In terms of redevelopment opportunities, um, we want to continue to see new businesses move into the area, um, thinking about other creative business types um, that help uh, set up new opportunities. Um, we think this is also a key area for restaurants 
um, within the corridor. And in terms of public realm opportunities, we really want to see that the public realm is really supportive of businesses. So that this could be a great place for really building, uh, you know, street cafe culture, for building window shopping, and for really seeing um, a, a, a public realm that's really supportive of business opportunities. So let me stop here and talk a little bit about the visions and goals for that have been developed as a part of this project. The first vision is that we want to see Staples and Leopard um, as vibrant and dynamic places that attract visitors from across the city to enjoy the offerings of local business, civic and cultural attractions, and community events. We want to increase private investment and reduce vacancy, and we want to reimagine the public right of way to create an attractive environment that promotes business investment, community activities, and local identity. The second part of the vision is building on the strong foundation that's created by the established and iconic businesses in these corridors. We want it to be a unique place for residents to live, work, and play. Um, our goals here are to activate key sites throughout the corridor that are currently vacant or underutilized and to develop programs that support and incentivize investments by small and local businesses. The third component of our vision is making sure that we have a five-year strategy based on the community input that provides clear direction on current and future investments and programs planned for the Uptown Corridor area. Um, Within this goal is to develop a specific implementation plan that incorporates public, private, and community investments and activities, and to coordinate with the public, stakeholders, business owners, landowners, to make sure that this plan is actually implemented. So from here, I'm going to talk a little bit about the toolkit. What are some of the specific projects, policies, and programs that we have to put into place in order to see this vision realized? going to start by talking about three recommendations um, in what we call designer projects. That's um, looking at the corridor redesign, thinking about key placemaking opportunities, and talking about parks and open spaces. The first recommendation is to redesign the corridors to support multimodal transit and really create more speed street activities. And on a number of these slides, you'll see in the corner the little talk bubbles. Um, those are some of the things that we heard that led us to these recommendations. Now, when we talk about redesigning the corridor, we really wanna think about long-term uh, and short-term as, as two sort of separate components of thinking about this. You know, some portions of the street have recently been repaved um, and redesigned. And so there's not a lot that we are going to want to change from a capital perspective in those areas uh, in the short term. Um, so what we wanted to look at was what are some of the ways that we can do other types of short-term improvements in some of those places that we've already made investments? And then what are some of the areas that we might be able to do more long-term investments? Next slide. One of the key things that we heard in the public engagement and that we saw through the data is that there's a real opportunity to think about some different ways of conveying the traffic on these corridors. One of the best practices that's been used really around the country is the idea of converting four lanes to three lanes. Um, what happens in this type of conversion is to create one lane in each direction and then a continuous left turn lane down the center. Um, this opens up new space on the street because it uses less space, but it also has the uh, benefit of reducing crashes um, and providing uh, easier access for people who have to turn on those areas. Um, the NACTA, which is the National Association of City Transportation Officials, have laid out guidelines for this and say that really streets carrying up to 25,000 vehicles per day will function very effectively with three lanes. In a lot of cases, they will actually see better functioning and better times for people that are actually moving all the way through the corridor. Um, it actually optimizes the traffic as well, but has the added benefits of boosting the local economy and really creating more space for more opportunity. So using this, um, we you know, have this area then that is created by using less, street, less of the street space for traffic that gives us opportunities for, for new things to be in that space. Um, thinking about things like 
parking lanes, thinking about loading or picking up areas for buses, thinking about waiting space for Uber, um, thinking about spaces for parklets or new cafe seating, um, or expanding the opportunities for trees and shade and other amenities like that as well. So what we've done for each one of the corridors is we've taken the existing cross section that you can see with four lanes and then redrawn that looking at what we would create space for in both the short and long term um, by reutilizing that space. So as you can see in this drawing, as we go to three lanes on Leopard Street, it creates new space for this flex zone that could be used for parking or drop off or other things, creates the potential for space for bike lanes. Um, and that's you know without moving the curb or really investing all that much more than paint um, in order to be able to move that forward. Um, in the longer term, you could also redevelop the curb line and, and actually move those curb line and create new spaces for shade, create new spaces for seating, um, really intensify the opportunities for better lighting in the corridor um, and still be able to maintain the same level of traffic function. Similarly, looking at Staples Street, um, you can see that we've done a couple of different um, design opportunities here, looking at um, the opportunity for much wider bike lanes, um, along with parking, looking for opportunities for bus lanes um, or different opportunities there. And then also showing again in the long term when you are going to move the curb, um, what you can provide in terms of additional shade and other opportunities like that. And this type of work can also be done um, using things like uh, uh, planters to create new traffic barriers as well. So as you see on this component, uh, looking at Staple Street in the South, you can see that again, created new areas for parking, created new opportunities for bike or scooter lanes, um, and in the long term, really looking at those opportunities for um, additional greening and additional cafe seating um, in these areas as well. The second recommendation is to use short and long-term placemaking strategies to create distinct district branding and really help um, create an, uh, attractive opportunities within the, within the urban environment. So really looking at things like art, looking at things like crosswalks, looking at things like banners as key elements that could be used to create um, on this slide some key gateways into these different areas that we've laid out in the uh, initial part of the presentation. This also includes creating new nodes within the corridor where we have additional public art opportunities um, that could include things like street furniture, that could include sculptures, or even going on to the next slide, continuing to look at opportunities for art like murals um, or um, art on fences. We also want to look in the long term at creating a distinctive brands for these areas. So this is just an example of what some of that might look like. Now, we don't have exact names for these areas yet, and one of the things that you'll be asked in the survey is to give your ideas for what some of these places could be called and what we should think about when we're looking at these different zones that we've laid out. We also think that it makes sense to update some of the signage requirements um, and really uh, making sure that people know what businesses are there on the corridor um, and are able to really see the signage um, that draws them in. Finally, the third recommendation in this area is to reclaim some of this vacant land and unused road space to design some new green spaces and plazas. One of the most exciting opportunities we think is to really bring a brand new plaza to the city hall area. Um, this could be done through reclaiming some of the parking lot. Um, we really see this as a key opportunity to create a civic space um, right outside of city hall. We know that there are some negative activities going on just outside of city hall. And um, we really believe strongly that one of the best ways to combat that is really bringing more positive energy to the area. So we see that bringing a new park to the city hall area that could really be a, a focal point of civic engagement in the community as being one of the key things that we would be able to do um, to help activate this corner of Leopard and Staples. 
Similarly, down at six points, we have some really cool opportunities that are created by the angles of the different streets that come together um, in that area. Um, there are actually created, because of the angles of the streets, uh, quite a few small triangles that aren't really well utilized for anything right now. So what we want to do is really look at those spaces and see if we could really take one or two of them and create some new outdoor civic spaces in um, six points that would create, uh, you know, really fun community vibe, create some more spaces potentially for some outdoor seating for restaurants, um, and really bring a, a new kind of center to the six point area to build on all of the great activity that's already happening there. So in addition to the Civic Square um, and um, these other types of plazas, there are also opportunities to really continue to improve on the neighborhood parks that are in close proximity as well. Going to the next slide, that's really something that we can do through both specific design features, including you know, water features, water fountains, um, looking again at public art, really focusing on creating uh, great tree cover and great shade structures so that these places are usable. But then also looking at the types of organized activities like um, farmers markets, playgrounds, food trucks, um, outdoor gyms, and, and other types of program that really activate those spaces and, and really make them very exciting. The next section, we're gonna talk a little bit about policy. Um, and again, we have three recommendations, creating proactive communications regarding city goals, updating the unified development code, and then creating robust urban design standards. Recommendation 2.1 really focuses on creating proactive communications regarding city goals and available incentives. And this is one of the things that we heard strongly from our business working group as we talked with um, business owners in the corridor, that they really wanted to see uh, more engaged opportunities for them to understand where their opportunities to really connect with the city are, but also to have more peer-to-peer -peer cooperation and really being able to um, discuss with each other about the different types of things that will make the area better and that they can contribute to together. The second recommendation is to update the Unified Development Code to include urban design and land use regulations that are really necessary to implement the revitalization strategy. Um, the first component of this is to amend the Unified Development Code to implement the already adopted mixed use vision for the area um, that came from the Corpus Christi's comprehensive plan. Um, there's work still to be done in order to make sure that the future land use map that's already been adopted by Council um, actually is reflected in the regulations that are being used in the area. Um, some of these new areas that need to be focused on are really making sure that the use regulations are flexible, um, that they're requiring street life supporting standards, things that really encourage that cafe culture and window shopping that we've talked about, um, as well as a robust and relevant incentive strategy for the area. This includes things like what types of uses are able to be used in different areas? Um, how do we uh, regulate building length? How do we regulate the transparency? So where and when windows will be? How often are there entrances to the buildings? And how will that contribute to the street life that we want to see? And I'm going to hand it over here to Wei to take us through the rest of the presentation. Thanks, Zach. So um, apart from the zoning, we also want to introduce the design standards to complement safe and vibrant street improvement for the corridors. And the standards will guide the future street design and development to provide a more pleasant urban environment. Um, so the elements we are thinking about or looking at include pedestrian realm, looks at the sidewalk width and other pieces to support the walkability, and the bikeways looking to provide safer biking experience street furniture, looking to provide more amenities to public realm, building looking to create a closer relationship between the public realm and private sector, intersection looking to provide safer crossing, signage looking to provide a more cohesive and consistent experience of the corridors, transit and auto looking to reduce the conflicts and provide more pleasant experience for both drivers and transit riders. 
and also thinking about supporting an energy efficient future by requiring uh, AV charging stations and introducing flexible zones. So this is an example that illustrates how those design elements, what those design elements are and how these design elements can work together to create a vibrant urban environment. And this is an example shows you how the walkable urban environment can be achieved through street design standards. So those are, the, so those two are the same buildings. So the one on, on the left side is a Dollar General at Staples in Corpus Christi. As you can see, it has a big parking lot in front of it, which creates a large setback and the transparency of the building is minimal. All these reduces, all these reduce the connection between the building and the pedestrians. But with the design standards, we are able to create a closer relationship and pleasant street experience as shown in the picture on the right side with a smaller setback, more transparent building, and even more street furniture such as bike rack and benches. So we all understand that both Staples and Leopard are key transit corridors in the city and the transit station on Staples is one of the biggest and busiest stations. So how to provide a good transit riding experience is also something very important to make the project su successful. So in this recommendation, we wanted to make sure that we collaborate and provide support for the future transportation planning that will be led by the regional transportation authority, including making sure that street design offers transportation um, options and ensure that pedestrian realm has enough space to accommodate bus stops and pedestrians, ensure that the new bikeways design is compatible with RTA, regional transit authority standards, and provide good access to both cyclists and transit riders. Um, and also ensure the wayfinding signage provides instructions of bus stop locations and very importantly to provide shelters and shade at the bus stops where possible. So um, in the previous recommendations, we talked about how to make the corridors walkable through street design and regulations and parking is definitely one of the major components. And also our needs assessment finding already indicates that both corridors have oversupplied parking. So for future uptown corridors, we wanted to make sure that uh, we provide sufficient parking, but also smartly in parking distribution so that street space could be more efficiently used and there will be more opportunities for more, more amenities that support walkability and bikeability. So apart from the idea of flexible zone, which guys where you could place parking along with some other uses, we, we would also like to introduce this straight parking idea. So one is to create collective parking spaces that can, that can be shared by a variety of businesses such as parking structures so that people can park and walk to their destinations. The other one is to make arrangements so that one parking spot could be used by different parties at different times. For example, on Leopard Street, the parking can be dedicated to office use in the daytime, but to businesses during the night. So this is an illustration that shows you traditionally we designate parking space for each use based on the highest parking demand that increase the needs in parking spaces. However, if we strategically designate parking based on the needs in different uses during the different time of the day, the parking spaces could be significantly reduced. So in the last two sections, we talked about projects that can physically build the future uptown corridors and how these recommendations can be supported from the high level planning efforts. And in the last section, we wanna introduce the programs that could help impl implement those recommendations and make the corridor thrive, which includes the, which include the program to activate the corridors, unify businesses, help corridor maintenance and funding. So firstly, I wanted to, we wanted to create programs for festivals, events, and tours so that people living, working, and visiting the corridors would have opportunities to en enrich their lives and interact with each other more closely. And we wanted to make sure those programs are diverse in themes to provide opportunities for artists, LGBTQ groups, farmers to, advo to advocate their businesses, work, and voice. And the goal here is really to build a more inclusive community. So we know that there are already great businesses on both corridors, and this is one of the major attractions for people to come to the corridors. So how to unify the existing businesses and grow more is really key to make the corridors thrive. 
And this is also a comment we've heard a lot from the business working group meetings. So uh, the first strategy here is to reestablish a strong branding for the businesses. And this can be achieved through creating maps and advertisement for all the businesses on the corridors so that pe people know better about those destinations. And uptown corridors can be known because of those uh, businesses. And the second is to establish an organization that can better unify and support businesses. There are two good, two good programs that are providing those great uh, services nowadays. Merchant Association is a nationwide association that unifies the merchants and provides networking and support for the members. And the Commercial Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that acquires land and holds it in perpetuity for the benefit of the community. Apart from the business management, we also wanted to explore opportunities in establishing organizations for the corridor management, such as the Public Improvement District, which supports economic development, as well as tax increment in reinvestment zones and municipal management districts. And these are some, there are some other organized manage, management organizations that support community like neighborhood community development corporation and support cultural arts like cultural districts. And to clarify, these are the opportunities we'll be discussing more in details in our next phase. So the last part of the recommendation is really focused on the funding and implementation. We had two business working group meetings with local business owners. And one of the major things we heard from the business owners is that they desire for more simplified permitting process and stronger instructions in applications. So in this recommendation, we suggested a more streamlined regulation to assist in that so that it could incur encourage more businesses and organizations to apply for the programs. And we also recommend the city to pursue and establish more funding and program and grant program to help support the projects and move them um, to the next phase. Um, we've identified a few programs that could provide a good incentives and funding to help the corridors thrive, such as the adaptive reuse programs that help um, owners to improve vacant buildings, low interest loan programs that reduces barrier uh, to accessing capital for small business owners, and grants for building and facade improvements for existing buildings. Um, and some cities have already implemented and carried out um, good outcomes. So we certainly believe Upton Corridors will benefit from um, those programs as well. So these are the recommendations for Upton Corridor, um, Corridors concept plan. We are looking forward to hear your comments and thoughts. And for the next steps for the project, we will be having refined um, draft concepts for, for programs, projects, policies by early 2020. And we are opening our public survey um, from January to mid-February. So please help us with your input and pass it along to anyone that you think would like to contribute their ideas and comments. So, and if you have any questions, please send emails to me at way at asakurarobinson.com or Karen Costanzo, the project manager, we are happy to answer. Thanks for everyone and enjoy the rest of the survey.